welcome all here in the lecture hall and also welcome at home remotely. So this is the NTCT Data Science Seminar and also a joint event with Alice Life Heidelberg. And we are happy to have you here today, especially our guest speaker. It's Stefan Bauer. And um, welcome also to Ulrich Köthe. And he will do the introduction. Thank you very much. Okay. Yeah, this is Uli Köthe speaking. Uh, I also welcome uh, our speaker today, Stefan Bauer, uh, in the name of the Alice Heidelberg unit. Um, so we are very glad to have him here uh, talking about the news in causality research. So like 10 years ago, everyone thought that would be the next big thing. But then Stefan did not have a small uh, influence showing that it's not that easy as was believed maybe 10 years ago. So showing some impossibility theorems, for example, and uh, also some new ways of solving uh, the problem. So. Um, Stefan graduated from the ETH Zurich with his doctoral thesis, which also won a prize, and then went on to tubing and learned everything about causality in Bernard Cholkov's uh, school of thinking, then had a, a group leader position in Stockholm, and now is in Munich, and uh, the stage is yours. Thanks. Um, thanks a lot for the very kind and nice introduction and for hosting me he here. I already had some um, amazing uh, discussions yesterday and wanted to thank Julio and uh, Pablo and, and Sebastian for inviting me. And uh, in the morning today I, I was discussing with Oli Stegle and, and, and Kai and it's pretty amazing the, the kind of research you do in Heidelberg and I stay the, the afternoon till the evening today. So if you want um, I'm, I would be more than happy to discuss more and meet more people. Unfortunately, um, we had last week a cyber attack on our IT system, so if you want to contact me, please use my, my former email address at uh, K KTH, um, or reach out on, on Twitter, or just talk to me after, after the, um, the talk. Unfortunately, I can't access my Helmholtz email account. So if you wrote me before I came here um, for a meeting or discussion, I unfortunately couldn't, couldn't access and couldn't answer any of these. Um, that was already from the introduction, and then I would like to start. And I actually, I know it's an outdated slide, but I think um, I, I, I want to use it to illustrate a little bit some of the problems we have and why, it's, why I believe it's, uh, it's still interesting. And what you see here is a, is a classical causation versus correlation plot. Um, in this, this case, the example of chocolate consumption versus number of Nobel Prizes. And what you see here is basically a strong linear correlation, and you see that um, in particular, uh, you see that uh, Switzerland has better chocolate than Germany and that it helps to be uh, Swedish um, for, for winning a Nobel Prize. And, and admittedly, it's a little bit of an outdated um, a chart, so some countries significantly moved up, but still this is a strong linear uh, correlation we would have. And um, there were even afterwards um, uh, additional studies, so there was a very nice nature paper from Terence Sainowski and, and a couple of Nobel Prize winners where afterwards they were asked, well, do you eat chocolate or um, what, was the, what was the influence of consuming chocolate? And it's surprising, some credit the Nobel Prize to eating chocolate and some say, well, maybe they would have won two if they would have eaten more. So even there, there's not an, uh, uh, like a consistent answer. Um, but it's a, it's a fun article to read. And now you could argue, okay, well, what is even the, the problem to, to differentiate there and what would change in the, in the time of large language models? So we probably would go to the internet and then check for um, scientific articles. Here, for example, there's a double-blind placebo-controlled randomized trial of the effect of chocolate consumption on, let's say, neuropsychological um, functioning. And it's a, a surprisingly hard problem. So a large language model would probably be able to, to, to search the internet at some point, find these articles. But even there, um, it's, it's difficult. So here, they, they for example, um, they don't directly measure um, uh, like a significant effect. Part of the problem is that apparently it's still hard uh, to find very good placebos for chocolate. So you realize it's, it's not the right thing. So you stop eating it, and it might affect the, the, the studies. But even in these trivial cases, um, yeah, the, the answer is, is actually non-trivial. So for example, you can ask ChatGPT and say, okay, what is, does, it, uh, does eating chocolate increase my chances of winning a Nobel Prize? And um, you can even 
spin it back and forth, but at least there the answer is that basically um, it's, it's unclear. And why I pointed it out is that it's a surprisingly simple question um, in the sense that uh, opposite to, for example, smoking cancer, where you can't do a randomized placebo-controlled clinical trial, in chocolate we can at least do it. Like I can give half of your chocolate, I can give the other half of your chocolate, uh, of chocolate placebo and see, see what happens. But even then, even if we allow for that, it's a surprisingly hard uh, problem. Um, which most likely won't even be solved by the fact that you might have access to all, to all of the internet. Um, and that is a very trivial example of a two-dimensional case, so a two-dimensional plot. And now I hope... Oh, how does that work? Okay, so that was a two-dimensional plot, and on the right, I hope... Okay, sorry. Um, so it's a nice video. So basically what it does is showing... Um, you can, you can check the link afterwards. It's basically a video of someone cleaning uh, a room, and then there are cyclists on a TV screen while he's cleaning the TV, and uh, he lifts the TV up. At the same time, everyone in the TV screen basically crashes. So the, the, the question is a little bit in higher dimensional settings. It's surprisingly hard to find these examples which are convincing to humans. So this plot on the left, it's relatively easy to say, OK, there's probably a, a, an underlying factor like uh, um, wealth of a country, ability to invest in, in, in education, where you find and can debug um, correlation versus causation, but in higher dimensions it's surprisingly hard. Um, I unfortunately don't know exa enough examples where we have these typical plots from the left in videos, for example. So if you know very good videos where there's this effect of correlation does not um, um, cause, uh, imply causation, I would be very happy if you share them. Um, I think that that would be a very interesting study. Okay, so now how does that again work? Okay, and now there's a, there, for causality, there has been um, uh, an amazing success, like uh, as mentioned, uh, roughly 10 years ago. So the first was uh, Judea Pearl winning the Turing Award for his fundamental contributions to artificial intelligence um, through the development of uh, calculus for probabilistic and causal reasoning. And in 2021, um, Guido Imbens and, um, and, and, and Angrist won the Nobel Prize in, in, in economics for the methodology methodological contributions to the analysis of causal relationships. The Nobel Prize in economics was, was shared, but it's basically a Turing Award and a Nobel Prize for causality already, which is kind of very amazing um, uh, for, for the field. Yet a year, um, or at the same year, where, where Guido Imbens won the, won the Nobel Prize, he and uh, Judea Pearl actually had a very interesting conversation um, in a couple of papers back and forth. And, and, and of course, that uh, slightly continued on Twitter and is still online a little bit, um, where they basically attack these two, and it's becoming apparent that causality is basically split in two different communities. So one is focusing on cause-effect estimation, where you assume a fixed model and are interested in a parameter estimate, for example, and the other one is more based on the do calculus from, from, uh, from Perl, where you try to do causal discovery. So one is you want to learn the model, and the other one is basically I assume a model and want to get a good estimate. And here, for example, the criticism is that for um, causal discovery in the book of why we only illustrate very toy-like models, similar to this chocolate versus Nobel Prize consumption, where we have two variables, we understand there might be a hidden confounder, and it's at most these three variables. Um, and so there was... So this is a couple of interesting papers, and there's even more criticism. And... Um, for this, I actually would reference you to very interesting interviews. I, 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 I cite some of these quotations in the next couple of slides as well. And it's basically this, some of the superstars in causality um, giving answers to, to a scientific editor, I think, of where the field, how the field developed, what their experience was. And so it's, it's, it's very interesting from their perspective. And for example, on the left, we see that the causality won this Nobel Prize, and on the right, basically, Don Rubin, who's coming more from this potential outcome framework, he says that causal discovery is just a topic for cocktail conversation. So it's a very condemning, very clear um, statement that there are only toy models, it doesn't work, and it's not even worthy of a scientific discussion. Um, and, and, um, and to some aspect, um, I think... This illustrates this, the split somehow in this community, and to some extent you can indeed say that uh, for causal discovery, we, 
reflect a little bit of these success stories. And one of the big hopes now is that, for example, for genetic networks or these perturbational data, we can show some, um, some of the applications where this is indeed useful and where indeed it makes a difference. Um, so this is part of the, of the motivation um, for today. And what I do now a little bit is I give a brief introduction to causality. And then I present an approach for feature selection, which is not causal discovery. So it's solving a significantly simpler problem, but it's one of the few approaches I know where basically a cause-effect approach, which was on one side of this divide, was used for um, structure search or for a sub-problem of structure search, structure search, and where we can see very clearly what are frameworks, when this is even possible from observational data, and I find that very interesting. And I think it's a very, it's a couple of recent papers in that direction which make that interesting. And then hopefully afterwards I will still be able to talk about experimental design, but I have to, I have to see what my timeline for that is. And um, for both projects, um, I will mention it clearly, there are a couple of things we believe which are great now and, and work well and we have a good understanding. And we search for collaboration partners to bring that more into the biomedical field because we indeed lack a lot of the domain knowledge and, um, and that is unfortunately very important for the validation of these approaches. Okay, so here, um, just as a quick primer, so for causality, what is the main question? Um, it's basically what would happen if I do an intervention? So you are not interested in basically getting a prediction at the chocolate consumption at a, um, within a certain um, value you already observe, where you can necessarily um, uh, plot, the, plot the line, but you are very much interested what would, for example, happen if I change the chocolate consumption to, let's say, 150 kilogram per, per capita, so I move completely outside um, to the right of, of, of this um, chart. And in order to answer that, you need to make a causal assumption. So I think otherwise it's, it's okay and you have to basically say I cannot answer that question and that's completely acceptable. But if you provide an answer, you, need, you have an underlying causal model. So either you say that Nobel Prizes causes chocolate consumption, that chocolate consumption makes Nobel Prizes, or that there's a hidden confounder. Whatever you answer will depend on this assumption. And part of the problem is that um, all, all the options, so all your assumptions are equally worthy in these observational data, you can actually not differentiate between them, and that is why you actually have to mention them, because otherwise, I think without stating these assumptions clearly, you shouldn't make a causal statement. Um, and now what is the problem is basically what happens if you don't know the graph, but you need to learn or want to learn it from, from data. And what you see on the right is basically the number of DAGs and the number of possible graphs for the different number of nodes. So here it's only plotted for up to 10 nodes, and you see that basically in, for three nodes it's 25 um, directed acyclic graphs, and then um, for 10 nodes I can't even unfortunately pronounce the number because it's, it's, it's so huge. And Searching this super exponential space, super exponentially growing space, is extremely hard. And in addition, it turns out that especially from observational data, I would argue that um, purely causal discovery from purely observational data is, is basically impossible. Um, I think you need very strong assumptions, and it's very debatable if these assumptions are valid, to do it from observational data alone. And there's a the big, um, the big um, um, hope right now is that basically if you can move away from just observational data and get, for example, interventional data in addition, um, this becomes more, much more possible, and that with this recent advances of deep learning, you can actually search uh, efficiently in the space. And for this, we gave recently an ICML tutorial with, with Rosemary Kay, um, and I put the link on, on the bottom of the slides, and part of it I actually take in this introduction. So for structure learning, you have this ex super exponentially growing space of, of DAGs, and there are two ways you can basically um, identify the causal graph. So one is you basically make very restrictive assumptions on the functional nature of the data. This might be graph assumptions, this might be functional relationships um, on the subsets of, of these graphs, or you use this interventional data, and then it's actually, you're actually able using, for example, this interventional data to regularize your search space and actually <coughs> hopefully converge much closer to these possible answers. And this is something we see more, more and more now. So um, 
Uh, again, these assumptions which we make, so this I will illustrate in the next uh, couple of slides, are extremely important uh, to mention. And this is another view of this topic. So on the left, we have a classical statistical model, which basically is a joint distribution over random variables, and it's one joint distribution. And on the right, you see an illustration of a causal model, which is not just a single um, joint distribution, but it's basically uh, a poset of joint distributions, one for each possible intervention. So basically, an intervention indicates which joint distribution you should use. And how do you move from the left to the right? It's basically implied by these assumptions. So how you can move from a statistical model to a causal model is, de is determined on these assumptions, which cannot be expressed by the joint distribution alone. And that is why it's so important to state them clearly. And there's a couple of problems with, um, with some of these assumptions. So here is, again, one of these quotations from these interviews. So this time it's, it's uh, Jamie Robbins, who, who is a professor for epidemiology at Harvard. And he has this, um, has this quote, before you can pull a rabbit out of a hat, you have to put the rabbit in. So this references to this magician on stage who basically pulls the rabbit out. And somehow we all know that sooner or later there must be a rabbit put into the cylinder before you can pull it out. Otherwise, the whole trick doesn't work. And here, for example, he, in this interview, he explains one of these algorithms. And in particular, he mentions that basically it was for genetic networks, that one of these key assumptions is faithfulness. So faithfulness is, is kind of a technical assumption. I, I put some references for it below. But basically, it tells you when you can conclude from conditional independencies um, to, uh, to infer, basically, dark constraints. So it's kind of a technical term linking, linking both frameworks. And it's somehow necessary for a lot of these algorithms to assume faithfulness, to perform causal discovery. But what he points out is, is basically that this assumption, which seems reasonable or innocent at the beginning, potentially um, puts a lot of um, un, um, unsought or, or unwanted conclusions already in your algorithm by basically being the rabbit you pull out. So he mentions that they are able um, uh, to by by uh, by from complete ignorance of the gene network to complete knowledge seemingly by magic and how is that possible and that is basically part of this assumption how he moved from the left from a statistical to a causal model so here basically there's a clear criticism of some of these assumptions and there's a huge argument in the field when this is okay or when it's not okay but what I want to mention is that some of these assumptions are really critical and potentially have unwanted effects and um, Another quote, so this is the final quote from these citations on these interviews. I think they are really, really good and highly recommend to, to, to read them. So he actually mentions that he's less critical now of this assumption of faithfulness. And the key reason is that he wants to evaluate most of these algorithms by a downstream task. So for example, drug target uh, um, um, discovery or hit rate for, rending, uh, for recommending disease-causing genes. And basically, if we have these algorithms, then we measure who perform, which algorithm performs very well in this, um, uh, in, this, uh, hit, in this hit rate. And then we can basically conclude that's a good algorithm. And right now, that is one of the key problems in our field, that we basically cannot directly say what is a good algorithm. So if you ask me what is, what is the best algorithm, it's, it's quite hard to, to say. Potentially, I would argue that if you're not interested in directed edges, it's probably Lasso, but it's hard to say. Um, and one of the big problems and one of the big hopes we have for biology is basically that we can work towards getting access to data or towards these uh, data sets and benchmarks where you can actually try and improve some of these algorithms, which, which has been extremely helpful in other disciplines, like ImageNet significantly changed computer vision because there was something you can basically optimize for. There's some side, negative side effects as well, and crazy overfitting, but at least that definitely helped. And, and in our case, that's, that's for sure still missing, especially from, from um, um, in the real world data sets. And now I basically want to present an approach which goes in this direction and combines cause-effect estimation and, and structure search. And there's one view I wanted to mention and one line of, of recent work I think is very interesting and provides um, a coarse grained interpretation. So it's a very particular interpretation of causality, but you could say it's a debiasing method. So before I provided this high-level view, and right now what I say is basically one view of causality is that you are interested in getting a de-biased estimate. So you're interested, so if you have a parametric model, you're interested what is the ground truth or close to the ground truth estimate of a parameter theta, which gives you this effect of a certain variable. 
And for many prediction problems, you don't care about this ground truth parameter, but if you want to make it, use it, for example, for decision making or for changes in distribution, you want to know the ground truth. And I think it's an, a less well known or um, less general view, but thinking about it as a debiasing method where you do an estimation and then you want to get a debiased estimate is, is one way to view causality. Because it likewise comes with a different trade off. It tells you you're interested in debiasing, not necessarily in getting a variance reduction. So it's very clear what you optimize for and that there's a side cost. And this has been more a trend in the statistics community. So there's a couple of, of papers, some of them are very highly cited already, and are still ongoing research. So one of these directions is, for example, debiasing the lasso. So we know that the lasso, this L1 regularization, is, is very powerful. It's one of the best understood methods. But admittedly, it introduces some regularization and some bias because you set low values to zero which doesn't necessarily imply that this is true. Like you do that for multiple reasons, partially because you have an underdetermined problem, but then in decision making, you want to correct for this regularization term you introduced to solve your problem. And um, how can you do that? And there are some very nice statistical papers. They are not that easy to read in the sense that they are really written for statistics. For the statistics community, which you already see, Annals of Statistics um, are, are two papers references here. But I think it's a very interesting direction, and I will discuss this double or debiased machine learning um, a little bit more in detail. And interestingly enough, that is why I point the point, the paper additional out. These papers are quite connected to conditional independence testing as well, and we know that conditional independence testing is hard, so you sh shouldn't. Uh, do that and use approaches based on conditional independence testing necessarily for causal discovery. And interesting enough, I think it's kind of a rediscovery of methods developed in the 80s and 90s. So one of these earlier papers is this root end consistent semi-parametric regression. And what I present now is basically something very similar. I, I, I don't necessarily claim novelty in the method. Um, even it that you can do that was basically mentioned both in, in, the, in at least two of these papers, in the double machine learning and the hardness of conditional independence testing. It was mentioned that you can use the same method for search, but it wasn't explicitly shown, and my guess is that even in the 80s they already mentioned it. But I find it nevertheless very interesting. Um, let me see. Okay, so here I, 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 here's basically the problem of double machine learning. So this is... Um, uh, um, the paper I mentioned before. So assume that you have a problem in, in high dimensions and you have, have a, a, a target variable, let's say y, and then a particular variable, which is called d, where you're interested on the effect of d on your target. Um, so let's say, for example, y is your income as a company, and then you want to understand what is the effect of a marketing action, or what is the effect of, let's say, an interest rate hike, or something like that. You want to estimate this parameter, which gives you this effect of this variable very well, while at the same time you know you have access to basically an Excel sheet, where we have hundreds of variables, which might all be correlated with, with, um, with, your, with your variable D. And so what are possible solutions, what you can D? What, what you can do, well, one, one thing is you just ignore all the access and you just do a regression for basically estimating one parameter, which is what is the effect of D on Y, but you know that you excluded multiple variables, this will be a biased solution. Another thing, and um, another solution is basically predict Y given D in the first step, then try to fit an additional model on the effect of X on Y and then iterate until convergent, but this again will give you a biased estimate. And one of these other solutions was um, what uh, Viktor Chernokulkov and, and collaborators came up with, was this partially um, nonlinear model, which they called double machine learning, which is very inspired from the semi-parametric statistics. So what you have here, so on the right, you have basically assumptions on certain uh, conditional uh, um, uh, independencies between your noise variables. But what you have here is you model it basically as a linear model in your variable of interest, which is D. And at the same time, you model nonlinear models for the effect of these axes on the D and of the axes on the Y. So it's a partially um, linear model, which, which you try to fit. And now they provide a recipe of basically what to do. And the recipe is, is relatively straightforward. It's a very long paper. It's a technically difficult uh, paper to read. It's 80 pages, and they basically show that the name on orthogonality condition holds. So I, I won't be able to go into the details, but it's, it's about finding you an unbiased estimate of this parameter um, 
of this parameter theta. And what they do is basically they first predict um, and use a machine learning model for this variable m, which is basically the effect of x on d. And then they train a machine learning model um, g, uh, which is the effect of x on y. And then they do a linear regression of the residuals from the second step on the residuals from the first step to get an estimate um, of theta zero. There's an additional step where you need to do cross-splitting but what they basically show, and where you see multiple block entries on, on the right, is that in this procedure, you get an unbiased estimate for your C to zero. And it's kind of an interesting problem formulation, which is already highly picked up. And why is it called double machine learning? It's basically called double machine learning because M and G can be nonlinear machine learning based models. So potentially, I think in theory, only Lasso is valid for some of these assumptions, but potentially you, and, and what we use as well, is you can put in a random forest or a neural network for estimating this, using somehow combining machine learning with classical statistical inference for an unbiased estimate. And that is, um, that is a quite a, um, an interesting method, but you are very interested only in one parameter estimate, given that you are somehow um, able to write down that model. And what is now interesting is that you can do causal feature selection with this method. And for causal feature selection, what you do is actually plot it on the left. So here you are not interested in full causal discovery, so you are only interested in the direct causes of, a, of your target variable y. So you have y and then you have these direct causes. In this case on the left, it's x1 and x2. And then you have an un arbitrarily complex network afterwards, up, up, upstream, so to say. And why is that interesting? Um, I think it's interesting for a couple of reasons. Multiple times I think you are only interested in these direct causal parents. One of the reasons is that they have a, a really direct effect on your target variable. If something is far away of your target variable, it's pretty unlikely that if you intervene there, you will have significant effect on the target. Um, so in principle, you would like to have these X's, X1 and X2 variables because they are directly connected to this Y. And um, what is interesting about this problem is you, you're robust to hidden confounder on everything, basically, uh, um, on, on, on all the, and, and all complexities you can imagine on this network between the covariates. So previously, you have very strong assumptions on causal discovery, for example, our cyclicity. Um, many methods assume linearity. And here, you only assume right now linearity in, um, in the direct causes on Y, and everything else can be arbitrarily complex, nonlinear, and so on. And that is kind of a very interesting setting. And what is interesting is that you can use WML pretty much out of the box for feature selection for identifying these X1 and X2. And the interesting result is that if X1, if you basically do search through all possible um, features by basically um, doing a two stage regressions each time, where you put X, uh, your, your one of these x's um, uh, in, in, in these regressions for M and G in this double ML. And what you can show is that um, an, a, a particular variable is a direct cause if and only if um, your conditional covariance um, is, um, is non-zero. So you basically run it for each variable, you check if the estimate is zero or not zero, and if it's zero, it's not a direct cause. So it's kind of relatively straightforward and scalable to implement, and you only need to do some form of normality test or t-test to decide if something is zero or not. And this is what you see here. So this scales extremely well, because you only basically need to loop through your variables once, and you can do that for a thousand variables relatively efficiently. Um, and, um, and here again are some of these necessary and sufficient necessary assumptions on when this works. So some of these assumptions, what you need to have is basically that, it, that your noise is additive and exogenous and independent of these features. I think that is a somehow standard assumption in causality. I think that is not the main problem. Then you assume that there's a linear effect of these direct causes on your target variable. That is somehow a stronger assumption, but that, there are already papers now from Victor Chena Chukov's group and so on that you can do that non-linearly. And the strong assumption is that Y has no direct causal effect on any of the features. So there's no loop of Y back to the features X of these covariates. It's kind of a strong, it's a very strong assumption. It's hard to check directly. Um, what you can see, some of these applications would be that, for example, Y is a phenotype and then the genes, which genes cause this phenotype? And then you would imagine that the phenotype doesn't cause the genes. 
but that is a strict um, a strict assumption, and it's part of where the magic happens, because you basically remove a lot of the cyclic relationships between y and the axis. Your problem becomes much simpler, um, and you trade you make a trade-off for this for basically allowing then acyclicity between these covariates, hidden confounders between these covariates, and you don't need any of these other additional assumptions. So this is kind of neat. But you can't do full causal discovery with that, because your assumption that y has no children implies that you just can't do it iteratively for each node, because then if the next node is not allowed to have children, at some point you basically have a trivial graph where everything is independent of everything. So that you wanna, don't want to do, but I think for observational data, you can show that this is this, uh, for identifying these uh, features, like these three assumptions I mentioned, are kind of necessary. So you can show that, and it's, that is kind of interesting. And what you see here is basically that this works quite well. It's kind of an unfair comparison in the sense that we compare against a lot of methods which do full causal discovery, which is kind of a much harder problem in a more general algorithm, so you would expect it to suffer. Um, but here you see basically that this works quite well across a massive number of simulated data sets um, for different noise settings, for different sparsity settings of these features. And it's very cool that you don't have these additional assumptions on, for example, acyclicity between covariates or nonlinear relationships. So this is why I'm, I'm relatively convinced that this works in these settings. And now where we search for especially collaboration partners is that what I showed before is that basically you can have restrictive assumptions on the functional num nature of the data. So this is what we did. We basically said Y is not allowed to have a child. And that makes this problem much simpler and we even focus only on direct causes. So these are these assumptions what we basically put in such that this works. And the second aspect is that you can use interventional data. And now the interesting nature happens a little bit that you can get away and relax some of these restrictive assumptions by allowing for interventional data. So for example, right now we assume that basically here on the right, you see that everything basically happens to the left of y, and we assume there's nothing to the right. But if you allow an intervention on y, you can immediately say that you basically can remove everything to the right of y. Because if you intervene, you basically see what changes, and then you can remove that from your set of covariates, and then run this step again. So if you have, so it's kind of an ill-posed problem, because we have a method now which works quite well, and we don't have, there are some problems where this is interesting, but if you have a real-world application where some of these aspects can be verified, where this is indeed, for example, a problem where you can either intervene on the phenotype, let's say, or you know that the phenotype Y has, or the variable Y has no children, this is kind of an interesting algorithm to play around, because it's theoretically very clear you have necessary conditions, you have convergence rates, you have valid confidence intervals, you have a lot of these things, you have doubly robust properties, by just simplifying this problem a lot. So you don't do full causal discovery, you make one of these assumptions um, here that Y has no direct causes effect, and then you can show that for this specific subproblem, this is something which actually works. Um, but it's a very, yeah, it's a very specific subproblem. So now in the remaining time, I actually want to, and, and for this, yeah, if you're interested in this problem, we are very excited about that approach and actually search for, for collaborators, especially in biomedicine, which would be interested to apply that. And now there are a couple of things I still want to talk about for full causal structure discovery. Because before, we only used observational data. I think for, for observational data alone, full causal structure learning is a little bit out of, out of scope um, without these, these assumptions. So you, you need to restrict your problem to, for example, feature selection and then it becomes possible. And otherwise, you need interventional data sets. And generally, if you're interested in full causal discovery, there are these two different and competing approaches. Some are uh, and basically in this category of constraint-based approaches, where you can perform a lot of conditional independence tests, which, which was already shown to be difficult and hard. And the other approach right now is score-based approaches, which is right now very popular, especially with these neural causal models. Um, but there's another viewpoint how you can look at the problem, and this is, this is basically a different separation. And the way I want to mention is that I think the supervised frameworks, they are slowly taking over across a wide range of problems. So on the left, we see these classical causal discovery problems. You basically have unlabeled data, you define a score, basically how well a graph fits um, the particular data, and then you basically go through iteratively, for example, or by some greedy heuristic, you go through all possible graphs and calculate the score, and then you pick the one which fits the best. And this is basically, I would argue, 
99% of the algorithms out there if, if they are score-based. And now supervised frameworks become more, more popular, and this is slightly some of these relations again to these large pre-training models. So what performs incredibly well, um, and, um, and there are only two papers to, to the best of my knowledge, one from ETH and one from DeepMind, is that you basically simulate all possible graphs and you create a synthetic data set. So you basically take, uh, let's say if you have three nodes, you generate all possible 25 graphs, you uh, um, simulate all possible noise scenarios, and then you have a data set which basically covers your space of um, three-dimensional graphs, and you train a neural network basically which gives you a mapping from the observation to the graph. So there are some technical details, and you can basically um, use different structures, but you can use a transformer, for example, train that, and then you have a, a supervised learning problem which gives you from observations to what was the graph which generated the synthetic data set. And then at a new data point, when a new data point comes on, you already have a trained neural network, and basically it's super fast to tell you the mapping, what was the closest um, ground truth graph which is most likely to generate you that, that, uh, that data set. And this is somehow interesting because now you can imagine, like for, for three nodes I mentioned there are 25 graphs, that's doable. For 10 nodes I already couldn't tell you the number, how many graphs there are, <laughs> because it was so huge I, I didn't even know what it is. Um, and, and that is only 10 nodes. Now, if you want to do that for 1,000 nodes, that's, that's a huge data set. Um, but that we see not only in causal discovery as a winning approach right now, that basically you simulate for like six months on multiple GPUs and then you train this neural network. We see that across a wide range of problems. So people try that, for example, on tabular classification, you train a transformer model on simulated data, and then at inference time, you're very fast. It's kind of cheating a little bit in the sense that you try to be in distribution always, you try to cover your space with all possible simulated data sets and then at inference time you basically hope that you map it and there's no theory for that but it's, it, it works surprisingly well and it's kind of, it's a mixture between being frustrated that something like this works so well and you don't have theory but empirically that's a very strong, um, a very strong method and it's just getting better in a sense that you can keep, I mean, you can, if you have the industry resources, you can just keep up your GPUs running it and running it and running it. And for many problems, I would even argue that this is sufficient in a sense that um, we tried a lot of approaches, for example, for gene network inference <laughs> and tried to infer a thousand dimensional graphs, but then when we give collaborators then this one thousand dimensional graph, uh, it's a little bit too tough to even interpret it. So at some point, I guess you, you don't even care anymore probably about the graph structure because it's so complex and huge that in any case you can't necessarily um, interpret it afterwards anymore. But I wanted to mention that explicitly because I think that is one of the trends we have right now where a lot of the field is working empirically that is surprisingly stable to train, it's surprisingly robust, and it works empirically very well. So if you're interested in one of these approaches, try some of these supervised frameworks out. And then... <clears throat> I wanted to mention, so this is still one of these remaining overview slides, um, what are the hopes for combining deep learning with causal structure learning, and I think there are two. One is that basically you can avoid this discrete search spaces by using gradient-based optimization, and you get basically more complex relationships between these variables, so these functional relationships can be arbitrarily complex. And the as second aspect is, is very interesting as well, um, it's not clear yet how useful that is, but you basically learn a distribution over graphs. It's not necessarily always a posterior model, but it's some form of distribution over graphs, which potentially could be very helpful for experimental design or for exploration. Right now, even if you would get the true posterior, it's always hard to evaluate how useful these uncertainties or posterior models really are. And there are multiple alternatives like ensembles, like bootstrap models. So this is a whole open topic which will actually prevail. But this is an interesting aspect, I think, um, what, what people hope about. And um, yeah, I think I, I, I mentioned these two slides. So why, why do these causal causal, neural causal models actually, how do they connect, or what is the underlying high-level heuristic for that? And one of these connections between causality, deep learning, and generalization um, is the insight that causality is a lot about factorizations of these joint distributions. And the insight is basically that the right factorization um, will lead to a faster adaptation. So this is again a heuristic, so it's, it's, we don't know if that is necessarily true, but we assume it's true. And this is illustrated on the right to some extent. So assume that, for example, you have the event 
that it rains and the event that you open the umbrella. Then the cause effect, like the right factorization is very clear. But assume now that there's, for example, a change in the weather, then you would need to update your probability that it rains. But your mechanism, the mechanism which is I open the umbrella given that it rains, will stay fixed. So you will only need to update one factor. But if you have the wrong factorization, you will need to update both factors. Now it's a very crude heuristic that updating two factors takes more sorry, takes more samples than updating one factor. And it's not even clear if that is in a range where it's measurable. But that is basically one of these one of these assumptions. And what people tried now, and which was pioneered by, by Yoshi and, and, and Mila in his lab, is basically use the speed of adaptation as a learning signal to identify the model. So if you have multiple interventional data sets, you basically sample a couple of graphs, you check which adapts faster, you keep that one, sample again an intervention, you check which of the possible solutions um, adapts faster, and so on. And with enough interventions, you can, I mean, you clearly get to the ground truth model, because if you have enough intervention, there's only one possible solution in the end if you intervene on everything. And this is basically one of these examples. There's now a wide range of possible models, and uh, there are a wide range of different scores, very different op optimization strategies. But basically, you do this um, iterative loop where you sample graphs. You basically take as a reward the speed of adaptation or the robustness or different uh, scoring mechanisms for checking which, which graphs you prefer. And then you, you update your graph sampling, and you, you keep and doing that until convergence. And you get some distribution over these graphs. And before, before the purely supervised approaches came up, this was the state of these art on the simulated data sets. Now the supervised approach would lead on most of these data sets, I would argue, which are on most of these synthetic data sets, we can evaluate it with some form of graph metric. And now why is that interesting? And so this is basically the remaining of the talk. What I want to talk about is, um, especially um, experimental design for causal discovery. So right now, we always assume that we have some observational data and we have these interventions given on which we can test it, but we didn't necessarily create the interventional data set. And one of the frameworks to basically combine um, these models, which is very popular, is this framework of Bayesian optimal experimental design, where you basically try to maximize the mutual information of a potential outcomes given graph structures and parameters and where you have some, um, some observation, some data, and then need to decide on the experiments, basically where to intervene and what to intervene on. And there are a couple of interesting problems, I think. One of the interesting aspects is that these, um, it's not necessarily theoretically valid already, but for example, because you have a distribution for most of these neural causal models, you can somehow, even if it's theoretically not clean, you can somehow just combine it in the spatial optimal experimental design by pretending that the distribution inferred is your true posterior. So somehow you can combine these frameworks and then have a pipeline for this experimental design. And the, there are a couple of problems with that. So you need a full posterior over these graphs, and then you need to um, you need to optimize for this um, mutual information, which is an arbitrarily complex problem, and it's extremely hard. And for this, what I mentioned at the beginning, and what Jamie Robbins likewise mentioned is, we are very excited about biology to test these potential benchmarks in the real world um, for causal discovery methods. So if you have a causal discovery method, there are basically three natural downstream tasks. So one is cause-effect estimation. So given I have a structure, what is the effect of a particular variable? Another one is imputation, assuming that data is missing, but not missing at random, such that there's some underlying graph connecting it. And the third one would be experimental design, like where to intervene next to identify this underlying structure. And imputation is kind of an indirect downstream task. Cause-effect estimation is very particular. And so one of the big hopes of the community was that experimental design and the hit rate experiments would actually solve a lot of problems by providing these benchmarks. And one of these benchmarks we created are is, is gene disco, where we created a couple of real-world data sets. But the hope is, so it's, it's clearly an insufficient data set. So we hosted a challenge at iClear, and some of these results are, are just um, a little bit disappointing. And what I want, sorry, oh. Uh, what I want to show here is basically um, what part of the problem is. So I mentioned that 
there's the Spatial Optimal Experimental Design Framework, and it's very related to active learning. So on the left, you see one of these leading approaches. It's a very cool paper from Andreas Kirsch in, in, in Oxford with Jahan Gals group, which is Batchball. I think it's one of the first papers which uses batch experiments. And um, it's trained, so the plots you see here is trained on the extended MNIST data set. So extended MNIST is basically MNIST, the numbers, plus some handwritten letters. So it's more complex. And on the right, you see this data set, so in small resolution. But it's surprisingly clean, right? Like for you, you should be able, like, you know, there's a U, maybe that's a five, maybe that's an E. Like, uh, you're fairly confident in, in what these numbers are. And on the left, you basically see an active learning strategy. So you see the accuracy, you retrain after each sample, and then you sample new, so you, you get new data sets, you train a, a model on top on classification, and you basically see across this acquired data set that the accuracy improves and improves. But what you like will see that on this data set, on this very clean data set, it's surprisingly hard to like, even differentiate between a random strategy and kind of a leading approach from one of these leading groups in the world. Like random is surprisingly close to these models. At least the confidence intervals are, are not overlapping. Yeah? It's a consistent yeah. yeah, it's a consistent finding. And I think it's, it somehow it opens this hope that at some point we should do much better because random... Uh, shouldn't be the leading approach, but that's, so I think what is very successful here is that at least these lines are not overlapping. I think my consistent finding is more random and these other lines here basically would all be together. And now this is basically the plot we see, so it's a different cost function, so it's reversed, but it's basically for these genetic data sets in this gene disk or different acquisition functions. You see, like, if you move from uh, extended MNIST to, like, these genetic uh, data sets, like, all these acquisition functions are completely in the same range. It's, it's of course, just a hand-picked example, but that is a consistent across these data sets. And again, like, some of these methods are computationally intense. Like, it's, it's super difficult to run them. It's super costly to run them. And random is for sure included in this batch of like very, very good methods. Like it's even better than some of these other runs in, in the median. So this is some of the problems we find. And some of these other problems we find is that if we want to do experimental design and patient optimal experimental design, the first problem we need to solve is get a good posterior over causal graphs. And what we see here is some of these neural causal models applied to this reproglate data set with multiple interventions. And unfortunately, we never really got that to work as of now. So somehow you would imagine it's a genome-wide knockout, it's thousands of interventions. You should be able to do well. And here on this plot, it looks like we, we beat Scenic and all these other methods, but it's just one cell line. And if you go to another cell line, it, it looks completely different. So somehow we don't get these consistent trends. Correlation performs quite well. And what seems worrying is that the more well-known and well-studied a cell line is, the more links are reported. And the more well-known and well-studied a cell line is, the better correlation-based methods um, perform. So it somehow seems that we do exploration by correlation and not necessarily by causation might be uh, 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 um, yeah, a problem of how we correlate these data sets. So some of these open questions we, we, we are very interested in and with which I would like to conclude is basically how can we validate some of these causal models and some of these causal approaches. So we need some benchmarks and data sets and, and biomedicine seems the closest for that. We tried a lot with robotics, but it's very hard there as well. And um, how can we actually consistently and significantly beat random acquisitions in experimental design? I think on both approaches, we, we need to move forward. And with that, I, I would already conclude, but I'm, I'm around the whole day. So I guess some of these aspects were, were quite, quite fast. But if you're interested in discussing in detail, um, please send me an email and would be more than happy to meet you.